Yes, uh, I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional honor and custodians of the land on which we make, meet today, the Wenzhen people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respect to their elders past, present, and the elders from other communities who may be here today. So um, I would like to start with an introduction with uh, uh, Dr. Daniel Usnader. So Dr. Daniel Usnader is a lab head from the Peter Jetty Institute for Infection and Immunity. He completed his PhD in a group of Professor Detmer Zen at U University of Lausanne, Switzerland in 2014, before relocating to the University of California, San Diego for his postdoctoral studies in Professor Stephen Hedrick's laboratory. He then joined the research group of Professor Ak Axel Kallis at the uh, Dirty Institute in 2018. Since 2021, he is an independent lab head and NHMRC Emerging Leader fellow. fellow. His research focuses on CD8 T cell differentiation in chronic infection and cancer, a phenomenon most widely known as T cell exhaustion. Daniel's work has revealed crucial insights in the T cell differentiation and in chronic infection, including the, the discovery of a subpopulation of precursor exalted T cell that are responsible for maintaining T cell response in chronic infection and cancer, as well as for the pro proliferative burst following checkpoint blockade, a widely applied immunotherapy for cancer patients. Daniel's work has resulted in various first author publications in leading journals and has uh, <clears throat> and he has been awarded with a Prix de Excellence from the University of Lausanne, Switzerland in, 20, <clears throat> in 2019. The Robert, uh, Robert Koch Foundation in Germany honored him with a very prestigious award recognizing the next generation of scientists. Daniel has received multiple fellowships from Swiss Na National Science Foundation, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, NHIMRC, and the University of Melbourne to support his work. Daniel's group studies the mechanism including T cell exhaustion with the ultimate goal to ident identify targets that can be that can lead to the design and development of novel therapeutic treatments to improve health of patients suffering from chronic infection or cancers. Uh, so let, I'll give it to Daniel. Thank you. Thank you, Lee, for this kind introduction. And so also thank you for the invitation to present here or give this lecture on antiviral um, T cell immunity. And basically, before you start, before you can study antiviral CD8 T cell immunity, you actually need a virus. And I'd like to start here with describing one model organism, which is the lymphocytic choriomeningitis virus, which over the last 90 years has really fundamentally changed or, or changed how we understand immune responses to viral infections. And here's just a brief overview of a lot of features that have been um, identified or not, or implemented and improved during, um, due to the existence of LCMV. So where do we start to, to dive into this antiviral immunity? Well, I'd like to start 90 years back where it all began more or less. And this is a paper um, about the epidemic epidemic of encephalitis in St. Uh, Louis, Missouri from 1933. And what happened back then 90 years ago was that there was this encephalitis um, endemic in St. Louis with up to a thousand cases. And this obviously brought a lot of scientists and clinicians onto it to try to track what causes this encephalitis. And so what they did is they would isolate viruses from, from patients who suffered the encephalitis. And back in the days, it was probably a little bit easier and more cost efficient. They just would passage them through monkeys. And in particular, they had five monkeys that they would continuously passage them through. And what they observed back then, and I'm not referring to the numbers, what they mean, but they saw that monkey 37 we received material from monkey 800 but it didn't show any of the recognizable symptoms of encephalitis. So experimentally, what they did 90 years ago was they would take material from monkey 800, who has been infected previously, and they transferred this into monkey 37. But monkey 37 didn't show the symptoms of, of encephalitis. However, shortly after the expected time frame of the um, recognizable symptoms, Monkey 37 developed a fever. 
And this was not encephalitis. And so the authors concluded we're dealing here with a second distinct type of experimental infection. And for the students in the room, you can take this as an example. If you work a little bit on sterile, you might find something very important here. Because what they did then, they transferred this virus back and forth from monkeys and mice, and they tested different inoculation routes. And what they basically found is that this newly identified virus that they more or less found by accident caused in these monkeys a fever on day six that continued for four days and then gradually fell. But what's important is also they noticed that two months later when they challenged monkey 845 again, the monkey did not show any reaction. And this was basically a hint that there was some immune memory um, that was generated in these, mi in these monkeys. And as indicated, they also challenged mice with the viruses that they isolated from the monkey. And uniformly, they apparently failed to react to the inoculation. But what's interesting to show is that back then they stated in this paper, tests for immunity have not yet been carried out. And so overall, the conclusion of the study is that the virus that they identified had nothing to do with the encephalitis that was going on in St. Louis at the time point. But, and I quote, this virus, which differs from any virus with, with, with which the, office is, the author is familiar, will be designated in this paper as the virus of experimental lymphocytic meningitis. And ultimately, the strain they identified was what we now know as LCMV Armstrong. And this is a powerful strain that really over the, the last 90 years has fundamentally grown this tree. And so going from St. Louis, let's go to Australia because we're all in Australia. And, and I did some um, deep diving in how LCMV came to Australia and it ultimately was imported by Fritz Lehmann Gruber, who did his PhD back in the 60s or 70s in, in Canberra. And I've heard that Fritz worked his whole life on LCMV. And this is quite interesting because um, Fritz published this, this review in 1972, and I highlighted the sentence down here, but he also states that um, this virus has been maintained in the, in the simple host and mouse for 35 years, yet our knowledge of its properties is still scanty when compared with the wealth of information available for other viruses. And also interesting, the conclusion, when balancing medical and theoretical importance against personal hazard and technical difficulty, the result was quite unfavorable, and lack of interest was really not surprising. Things have changed over the last 50 years. I'm not bringing this up to, to highlight who imported LCMV. It's more important where it got into. And this is in Canberra. And Canberra back then in the days was really like a hotspot for, for studying virology. And for example, two people that picked this up were, were Mims and Blandon, and they published this article in 1972 where they already, used by using LCMV, described that there's a very, very potent immune response um, that is mediated by lymphocytes in these mice. And two other guys picked up on this, and they did this very simplistic experiment here where they infected mice of a certain strain with LCMV, and then they isolated the T cells and incubated them in vitro with specific target cells. And so they did three conditions. They used cells from a similarly infected mouse, and what they saw is, yes, in this setting, these target cells were labeled with, uh, were radioactive, radioactively labeled, and they could detect some specific killing. In the second group, they used uninfected mouse, either of the same strain or of a different strain, and this did not use any killing. And it's very important because you have your positive control and you have a negative control, and they were interested in the wild card. So what happens? If we incubate the cells with target cells from an infected mouse, but that mouse has a different MHC. And what they found out, well, there was no killing. And this is very important because based on this simplistic experiment, but really brilliant experiment, they concluded that T cells can only recognize foreign antigen if it's matched by the MHC. And again, 
It's something very important that if you design your experiment, you should always have a positive and negative control when you look at your wildcard. And if you do it simply as, as these guys, then you can get this study published in paper, uh, in, in Nature. And this is the entire paper that is done, and the two authors are Rolf Zinkernagel and Peter Doherty. And again, just follow these guidelines when you design your experiments. You'll get your Nature paper, you'll get a prize afterwards, and you'll get a building named after you. So the conclusion of this, remember your controls. It's very simple. But let's dive more into the antiviral T cell immunity. So what happens is when we as an organism get infected with a virus, then well, we will have naive CD8 T cells that will recognize these, these infected cells. And this is based on the work from Zinkernagel and Doherty. And what happens, this leads to an activation of CD8 T cells. So they massively proliferate, they accumulate in large numbers, but they also acquire a factor function. And ultimately, this army of, of potent killer T cells can eliminate all infected cells in our body. And once this has happened, there's no more need for, these, for this large army of, of killer T cells, so the majority of them undergo apoptosis. And what remains is a, is a different kind of CD8 T cell, which is quiescent, but it's pre-activated, it's primed. And so these so-called memory T cells can sustain for, for years in patients. And given that there's a secondary encounter with the same virus, well, then they're ready to go and they can provide a faster and more robust immune response, ultimately providing protection. And really, models for these infections are obviously um, LCMV, but also the seasonal flu infection follows a, a similar scheme to this. But it's way more complicated than just having a factor in memory T cells. And here's a similar scheme showing the viral, and the viral burden as well as a ensuing CD8 T cell response. But what actually happens is that CD8 T cells are very, very heterogeneous. And at this peak of an immune response, yes, you'll have the largest fraction of your cells are so-called affected T cells, which are very, very potent. But you also have other subsets of CD8 T cells. And once the infection is cleared, well, then the affected T cells, the killers, you don't need them anymore. So the majority of them um, undergo apoptosis, and the ratio of your of your T cell response alternates. And you, what what you're left with is a, is a larger proportion of so-called memory T cells, which are not immediate killers, but they are uh, they have a long-term um, longevity to survive over long terms. And so if you look at these different CD8 T cell subsets. It's a, it's a broad spectrum, and it's very, very difficult to say this is a memory T cell and this is a factor T cell. Yes, you can define the borders of it, but in between, it's 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 very fluent transition. But overall, what you can state is a memory T cell that origins very early retain, is a less differentiated cell. It retains a higher ability to survive. It retains a higher developmental potential to undergo self-renewal and the ability to proliferate. Whereas these affected T cells, they're more terminally differentiated. They more likely have gone more rounds of division already, and they have a clearly reduced ability to survive, but also to re-expand or, or to proliferate furthermore. And over the years, there's a sheer unlimited amount of markers that have arisen that um, define these different subsets. And probably during this talk, there's another two papers coming out with more markers. But overall, what you can conclude um, is, for example, the transcription factor TCF7, which encodes for the protein TCF1, is, is a very well-established marker for memory T cells that's highly expressed on, on cells that have a higher developmental potential. And it's also critically impacted in generating these T cells. On the other hand, BLIMP1 is, for example, a transcription factor that very clearly is defined in, to regulate and ex be expressed in, a, in affected T cells. And of course, it's not just transcription factors. There's also a series of, of surface markers to allow you to identify these individual T cell subsets or where they sit in the spectrum between a less differentiated memory T cell and a more differentiated affected T cell. But it's not just this. The differentiation pattern, um, how they are, how they look like, um, this entire heterogeneity of a memory T cell is also 
impacted by where the T cells are. So what happens again when we get infected and, and we generate this massive T cell response, well, they scatter out, they clear all infected T cells in our body, but then some of them reside in tissues such as the skin or the gut. Some memory T cells are in circulation, they patrol your body throughout lymphoid organs um, via the blood, bloodstream, and some memory T cells also really reside in the lymphoid organs. And so based on, on the localization of memory T cells, you can again contribute or impact this classification of where the cell sits in the spectrum. As indicated, central memory T cells with the highest developmental potential are usually residing in lymphoid organs, such as the lymph node or the spleen. You have a mix, a, a hybrid memory effector T cell that really is in the circulation that you can find in the blood. And then as indicated, um, there's also existence of tissue resident memory T cells, which really reside in the tissue and, and, and are the first line of defense. And it's really so complicated that there's even articles about just naming memory T cells. And this is one that's only even two years old. So again, if you take anything home from this, um, I would suggest that a CD8 T cell response can mainly be classified that you have a very strong affected T cell response that are responsible for eliminating the, the infection and these cells undergo apoptosis once this is done. And then you get a transition into a more defined memory T cell population and more or less that these are defined in, in three categories. You have a stem-like or central memory population in the lymphoid organs, effector or peripheral memory T cells that circulate, and tissue residents, which are in the tissues and really um, build up the first line of defense given that you have a, a secondary infection. But what all of three of these categories have in common is that they rely on the elimination of the infection. So once antigen disappears, but what happens if antigen persists? And we know that there are a series of, of infections that, that persist, that cause chronicity, such as HIV or hepatitis B and hepatitis C. And again, who comes in to rescue to, to allow us to study this? It's the lymphocytic choriomeningitis virus. And here's a study from 1984 from a postdoc back then called Rafi Ahmed. Um, and I'll refer to him a little bit more later. What he has done, he used the infection model with LCMV Armstrong where they infected neonatal mice. So at the birth, these mice have been infected. And what happened is the mice would, would tolerate the virus and become lifelong carriers. So the infection would not get cleared. And very interestingly, then Rafi Ahmed would pick several clones and try to isolate the virus that was generated. And the clone number 13 that he picked um, got propagated and is now a very commonly used uh, LCMV strain, the strain clone 13, that causes a persistent infection that strongly differs from infection with the, with the mother strain, the LCMV Armstrong. And so what happens? And again, it was nine years later, Rolf Zinkernagel, who is now, who, if you remember, got the Nobel Prize with Peter Doherty, not at this time, but he went back to Switzerland and, and he studied these T cell responses to different LCMV infections. And what they found in this paper in 1993 is that the virus persistence is basically facilitated by the exhaustion of antiviral cytotoxic affected T cells. And some data from the study is what they did is they used a different strain that was known um, to cause a chronic infection, which is called the LCMV dosa. And so they used different viral concentrations to challenge these mice. If they used a, a low dose, so this is 10 to the, hue, 10 to the 2 plaque forming units or viral particles, more or less, you can see that if you look at the viral burden, it goes up and the mice eliminated very rapidly. But if you increase the dose of this, then you can see that the mice are unable to clear the infection and it ultimately leads to chronic infection. And what's interesting is if they compared the T cell responses, and this was based on the ability to produce cytokines as a, as a measure back then, you can see an acute infection, you can find some T-cells into a memory phase 24 days later. However, 
if they challenged them, if they caused a chronic infection, they could not detect any T cells at a later time point. And so the conclusion was that these T cells are exhausted and, and hence you can't really find them. And so the lab of Rafi Ahmed, who, who was the first to, to pick this clone 13, really became one of the most prominent and driving forces over the last 20 years in, in understanding T cell exhaustion. And it was also fueled by, by a postdoc he had back then um, by the name of John Wery. And they had, this is the first, maybe their second paper on, on studying CD8 T cells in, in a chronic in, infection. And what they basically concluded um, at the end is that, okay, if you have a naive T cell and you challenge, it gets challenged um, by an infection, it differentiates into an affected T cell. If the, if the infection is cleared, the affected T cell will progress into a memory CD8 T cell. However, if the infection persists, your, this T cell will go on a gradual T cell exhaustion. And this is, they defined it back then in, in four different or three different stages based on the ability of these T cells to produce cytokines. And you, they named it partial exhaustion one, two, full exhaustion, and ultimately death. And as indicated, this was in, in 2003. And eight years later, there's been a lot of work going into it, but the model more or less stayed the same, that you have this continuous gradual exhaustion that once the cells go into the pathway into a chronic infection, they're, they're prone to death. It's a, it's a one-way street. Importantly, and I just want to highlight this, over, over these years, um, researchers in particular, John Wery, have identified that these exhausted T cells differ from highly functional affected T cells up here by the expression of inhibitory receptors. And the most prominent one is being PD-1, and I'll go into that in a bit more detail. So yes, at this time, what is T cell exhaustion? Well, it, it was clearly defined that these cells have an impaired effective function. They cannot kill infected cells as good as a highly functional T cell um, that you see in acute infection. And ultimately, this impaired effective function facilitates the disease progression. And then importantly, as indicated, um, these cells can also be identified by a high expression of inhibitory receptors, with PD-1 being clearly the most important. And yes, this early work has been done, a lot of it has been done in, in preclinical mouse models using LCNV, but it rapidly has been translated into the clinic that you could see that T cells um, of patients chronically infected with HIV or hepatitis B and C, they showed these critical phenotypes of, of, of exhaustion. And moreover, also tumor infiltrating lymphocytes are, are very common to express an exhausted T cell. And one of the most crucial findings over the last 20 years on studying T cell exhaustion is probably that you can target these, specifically these inhibitory receptors, and this can reinvigorate, this can boost a T cell response, an exhausted T cell response. And again, this was done first here in the lab by, by Rafi Ahmed, where they challenged mice with a chronic LCMV, and then they waited into the chronic phase, and then they um, administered different doses or uh, different doses of checkpoint inhibitors targeting um, the inhibitory receptor PD-1. What you can see here is that mice that received this, this checkpoint blockage showed an increase in T cell numbers, but more importantly, they showed a, a striking decrease in, in viral burden. And this was some really important findings. And ultimately, they went on to have tremendous implications clinical implications, because targeting checkpoint inhibitors is, is a very widely used cancer immunotherapy. And moreover, Science Journal in 2013 has recognized these findings of, of immunotherapy, of checkpoint blockade as the breakthrough of the year. And two pioneers of checkpoint blockade have been recently awarded with the Nobel Prize, really highlighting the importance and, and the significance of targeting these exhausted T cells. So, but it's a little bit paradox, because if we go back to this, to this review from, from 2011, and I highlighted this, that based on the finding or the, the general assumption at this time point was T cell exhaustion is a one-way road to death. You get persistently stimulated, and ultimately, you, you undergo apoptosis. But the ability to come in with a checkpoint blockade at, at, a, at this time point and reinvigorate 
the T cell response doesn't really make sense if you if you're going down a one-way road to death. And during my early days um, as a PhD student, we were interested in, in trying to pick up on the on this paradox situation. And we actually proposed a different situation that probably in regard similar to what you see in acute infection, where you where you generate a large population of affected T cells while also generating some memory T cells that, that have longevity and can survive over years. We believe that fundamentally, in response to a persistent infection, you, you also have a similar dichotomy. And you get two kinds of T cells. One that is an exhausted affected T cell that tries to eliminate whatever is there. But you also have some cells that retain developmental potential and they ultimately fuel, they feed into this effector population and, and as such to maintain it over long terms. And the big question was, okay, you have this hypothesis, but can we identify this memory-like T cell population? And to cut it down along, um, what we did is we looked at some of these markers that I described to you earlier on that really define a memory T cell population. And one of the markers that ended up to be to be a, a wonderful hit was the transcription factor TCF1. So TCF1 is down-regulated in affected T cells, but what we saw back then is if we looked at an exhausted T cell population, we found that there was a small proportion of cells that retained high expression of TCF1, whereas the majority of the cells didn't express any TCF1. And coming with the with the notion, the hypothesis that we had, we got really interested in this in the smaller population. And fortunately, we could find out that yes, these are the only cells that retain proliferative potential. And when we came in with checkpoint blockhead, these are the cells that respond to the checkpoint blockhead. So they are responsible for the proliferative birth and ultimately leading to improved immune response in chronic infection, but also in cancer. And we were not the only ones who, who found this out. There was a series of five papers. It's a very common thing if you work with LCMV that everybody's doing it. But you can see that um, simultaneously five papers in, in high impact journals came out identifying this heterogeneity within an exhausted T cell population and that one of them has a higher developmental potential. So what's the, how do these TCF positive T cells look like? Well, they're, they're very clearly defined that they express a hybrid phenotype between an exhausted T cell and a memory T cell. So they express higher levels of, of PD-1 or tox and they have an impaired cytokine profile. These are hallmarks of T cell exhaustion. But on the other hand, they express critical memory features such as the transcription factor TCF1, the AL7 receptor alpha, or BCL6 and ID3. And lastly, they completely lack any effect or cytotoxic potential. And this is also um, represented in their transcriptional profile. So they, they're really this hybrid population between an, an effector and a memory T cell. And importantly, these cells, um, after these early studies, have been identified in response to chronic viral infections, again, such as HIV or hepatitis, but also in a wide range of tumor samples. And it has been shown that a correlation between the presence of these T cells and the beneficial outcome to, to checkpoint blockage. And so, yes, based on this work, that these cells only can generate exhausted T cells, it's, it's that the T cell exhaustion is um, fun fundamentally imprinted in these T cells. We refer to these cells now as precursors of, of exhausted T cells or TPEX and contrast them really to the exhausted affected T cells. And importantly, I'm not going to go too much into detail, but as indicated, it has been shown that these cells are not just present in, in an antiviral immune response. You can also find them in, in response to tumors. And here, this was done based on, on bulk RNA sequencing that you can see that the TPEG cells coming from a chronic infection cluster very closely to the ones coming from a, from a tumor. And ultimately, all of this work has, has fueled um, studies in, in cancer patients where it clearly has been shown that this re responsible burst is restricted to these TPEG cells and the frequency of these cells correlates with an improved clinical outcome in cancer patients. And there's, 
a lot of studies have come out over the last five, six years on, on highlighting this. Coming back to this, the general scheme in, in an antiviral response, so, so this is the overall um, ability of T cells to respond. You have this dichotomy, you get two subsets, one is a memory, the other one is a factor T cell. And some, some of the work that we did recently was, okay, when is this established? When is this equilibrium between precursor and exhausted affected T cell established? And what we did is we went back to the, the LCMV model where you can directly compare T cell responses to acute challenge versus that of a chronic challenge. And how does it look? Well, if you look at T cells responding to the acute infection at this memory phase, then as indicated, most of the cells are TCF positive memory subsets, either effector memory or central memory. In, in contrast, in a chronic infection, it's still an ongoing immune response and you got really clearly defined two subsets. One are these precursors, the TPEC cells with high TCF expression, whereas in contrast, you have a lot of large proportion of, of exhausted affected T cells that, that are responsible for mediating um, viral control. But what we did interested in was, okay, how does it look when we look very early on when there's virus present in both situations and you can't really distinguish a chronic versus acute infection? And what was interesting is then the overall pattern was very similar. So we, we get in both infections a larger, a smaller fraction of precursor cells defined by TCF expression and a large fraction of affected T cells. Only the ratio of these two differed from the different um, viral strains that we used. But over two studies, what we found out, and this is very important, that these exhausted, these early precursors coming in a chronic infection already showed all hallmarks of an exhausted phenotype. And this is important because if we look at the overall scheme again, what this means is that independent from any infection that you will have, the T cells will differentiate into a, an early precursor cell and an early affected T cell. If you have an, a, a weak challenge that ultimately will be cleared within, within um, due to the primary response, well, then these affected T cells undergo apoptosis. And you, these precursor T cells more or less mature and become um, fully fledged memory T cells. However, in contrast, if you have a severe infection that ultimately might progress into a chronic infection, what happens is that these early precursor T cells completely acquire an exhausted phenotype, which is strikingly different from a weak infection. In contrast, these affected T cells, they, they show rather similarities in both infections. And if this infection, this severe infection, progresses into a chronic infection, well, what happens is that these early TPEC cells take over the immune response and continuously generate exhausted affected T cells until we're at a point where they more or less um, replace this first generation of, of T cells and you have a completely exhausted um, T cell response. Okay, so coming closer to the end, what is T cell exhaustion? Well, based on this work, it's not, we moved away from this continuous or gradual um, differentiation pat pattern that goes a one-way road to death. What we know now is that T cell exhaustion is more or less a functional adaptation to a strong stimulation that is initiated early in a T cell response. But why? What's the purpose of this? This doesn't really make sense. If you get hit very strong, why don't you go all in, you gather everything together and you try to eliminate it to become an acute infection? Well, the quick answer of it is you want to provide protection. Um, from immune-mediated pathology because basically these infected T cells are in your body and you don't want to destroy um, everything that's there. And this is again, was nicely shown by some work again from the same paper that I highlighted before um, from 17 years ago, where they genetically knocked out this inhibitory receptor PD-1 or in this, in this instance, it's the ligand. And what they saw is, okay, you would imagine that if we don't have this inhibitory signal, we'll get a very strong immune response. And yes, they could show that this is true, but what happened is this overshooting immune response caused a high grade of mortality in these mice, and the, the most of them, or all of them, um, died within a week. 
So this really indicates that, yes, there is a, is a protective mechanism implemented in T cell exhaustion. But what's interesting, and this was catched up nine years later, is that, okay, if you knock out this inhibitory receptor, you still have fundamentally exhausted T cells. So these cells still have a strong impairment in, in exerting effector function. It's more or less in conclusion that it's, it's a break. You unleash the breaks on these exhausted T cells and you accumulate more of them. And it's very important because it also highlights that, yes, these cells are dysfunctional, but they're actually still contributing fundamentally to mediating viral control. And you can see that here, that, yes, the numbers drastically increase, and this increase in numbers can lead to, to mortality in a host. Okay, so with this work, yes, the, the point of, of dampening functionality or dampening cell numbers is to provide protection from immune-mediated pathology and ultimately provide long-term protection. So this depletion of PD-1 really reduces the numbers, but what if we fundamentally change the outcome of a T cell that you get a, a highly functional T cell? And this was done that Basically, once you identified how T cell exhaustion is, is regulated on a transcriptional level. And once again, there was a series of paper that came out all at the same time. I don't think these are even all of them. But what they together identified is that the transcription factor TOX is highly expressed on exhausted T cells and fundamentally regulates this adaptation of a T cell following a strong stimulation. And what's interesting, if you deplete it, if you knock out tox, you get a more functional T cell response in terms of, of the ability to kill target cells and to exert effector function. But what comes along, and you can, you can titrate this down nicely in a chronic infection to avoid any given immune pathology. So what happens with a, with a non-exhausted T cell response when it is challenged persistently? in the setting. And here's some work that very nicely addressed this, taking advantage of different LCMV models. And so what they did is they co-transferred transgenic CD8 T cells control or ones that, that lack tox expression. And then they challenged them with the acute LCMV, the chronic LCMV, or a, a newly designed low antigen chronic LCMV, which basically mimics a latent infection. So it's a persistent infection but it not induces any signs of T cell exhaustion. And what was really interesting to see is, if you look at this ratio of, of tox knockout to wild type, yes, you get an increased immune response in the absence of tox, but this is sustained throughout the, the course of an acute infection. And similarly, in a, in a latent infection where you don't have signs of T cell exhaustion, you also maintain this Im immune response. What's interesting, again, and this comes back to these early studies um, from Peter Doherty, you have your positive and your negative control. If you look at your wildcard, what they saw is, okay, in a setting where you have persistent stimulation that induces T cell exhaustion, but you can't regulate this T cell exhaustion, you completely lose your immune response. And ultimately, the conclusion of it is that, yes, if you need this T cell exhaustion, you need to dampen your immune response, which comes along with an impaired um, effector function, but you need this to sustain long-term immunity to chronic infection. And ultimately, you can look at it from this point that in, if you have an acute inf infection and you get a, a low stimulation, then what happens to your T cells, they more or less, they go into sprint mode because they know we can eliminate this infection into a short time. There's nothing else that we need to do at a later time point. Whereas if you get hit hard with a severe infection that ultimately will progress into a chronic infection, T cells dampen their metabolism, they dampen their effector function, and this allows them to go to distance, to preserve potential to really sustain an immune response over longer terms. And so with this, I'm at the end, and a very short summary, what I've showed you is that overall CD8 T cells are a very important arm of the adaptive immune response, and they can provide protection, critical protection from viral infection, but also from reinfection. There's many, many subtypes, and it's very challenging to go into this. As I, as I mentioned, and especially with single cell sequencing, there's 
there's an unlimited amount of subtypes that everybody identified. But ultimately, once the infection persists, what, you, what we learned is that T cells are very resilient. They can adjust their functional adaptation, they're functionally adapt, and they can acquire an exhausted function, which ultimately allows them to sustain immune, immunity over preserved, preserved long term. And with that, I'm at the end, and I'm happy to take any questions. Oh, thank you, Daniel, for this great talk. And um, uh, let's go to the questions. And anyone on the teams, if you want to ask questions, just type your questions uh, in the chat. Thank you so much for that talk. Um, I was just a bit curious about like the implications in human disease, like. Um, what is there? Is there a case where there's like some sort of virus where in one person it can present and like be eliminated quite quickly, whereas in another case it might present as like a long-term infection? Um, and kind of what's the difference? Yeah, I guess like in terms of that antigen presentation, like um, where are, are there cases where um, it manifests in that case of like a long-term infection, whereas as opposed to like acute infection? Um, yes, the, I would say the best example is HIV, where you have elite controllers. So the majority of people infected with HIV, HIV will have an exhausted response and a persistent infection, whereas elite controllers have functional T cell responses and no persistent infection. But you're getting to the point where you're like the chicken and the egg. What Do they have a better immune response and control it, or they don't have an infection and they don't have the T cell response? But to more precisely answer um, your question, you don't need to go from person to person. You can even look into the same person. For example, the yeah, T cell responses to hepatitis C, where in the liver, T cells of a certain specificity are fully exhausted, whereas other ones are highly functional. And, it, and there is um, intention, or there's a correlation that this is driven by the amount of antigen. Thanks. Uh, so there's some questions online. I may just uh, read one. So uh, one is by Elizabeth, may have said it. Apologies, we've missed it. TCS1 is TF. Uh, what is known about downstream factors, role for beta catenin WNT signaling? Um, oof, that goes really into detail. Um, Yes, beta catenin is, I think, the the, the effector molecule um, downstream of, of TCF. And ultimately, I, I don't know the link precisely if you knock out beta catenin, if you can recapitulate the, the phenotype of TCF knockout. But if TCF1 is probably one of the main transcriptional regulators to generate functional memory T cells. If you don't have it, then you won't have any, any memory T cell response. So it's 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 almost like a master regulator of it. Thank you. Is there any more questions? Um, I have a question about the differences between the um, acute, chronic, and latent infections. Is that driven by the virus itself or the individual's immune response? Um, well, it's it's if you mean the models that I um, presented, that's the same virus. Um, if you if you well, there's slight modifications within the virus, but ultimately it's the same virus. And the the last one that I showed you is, it is a persistent infection, which comes back to the previous question. But there's a reduced amount of one particular antigen, and you can look then in the same host, and you can see that the T cells responding to the low antigen do not acquire any signs of T cell exhaustion, whereas T cells responding to any given other epitope that's unaltered are fully exhausted. So it's a beautiful model because you can look within the same host um, the effect of, of antigen levels in persistence 
and 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 then showed striking differences here. So, but both of these infections will be be chronic infections. It's just the amount of of one particular antigen. So, for example, the acute infection versus the latent. What's the difference there? Um, so the, the the latent infection that I described, which it's not latent, it's just mimics a latent infection such as CMV or EBV, which are persistent infections that are maybe not actively persisting and there's not a high amount of antigen. So it's only a latent infection studying the T cell response to this one particular antigen. Okay. Thank uh, so another online question uh, by Anthony. What implication do you think the exalted T cell phenotype has in autoimmune diseases? Would you expect this process to have a role in pathogenesis? Yes. Um, it, it's shown that in, in autoimmunity, you get the similar phenotype, that you have an exhausted response um, in, in diabetes, for example. And, and it's recently also been shown that the maintenance of, of this T cell response is even sustained by, by a similar population of TPEC cells. So it's, it's a very interesting field because what we are trying to do is overcome T cell exhaustion to make the immune response better. But in the setting of, of autoimmunity, you would actually try to induce it to make the, the immune response worse to, to um, prevent any pathology. Cool, thank you. Probably, uh, may I ask a personal question? And I wonder, um, uh, so you have talked uh, told about the T cell uh, exhaustion, like it's a mechanism of protect uh, your T cell and your immune system for the long run and also protect yourself from pathology lead by the immune response. But actually in the, in the context of cancer or chronic infection like HIV or HBV, people are actually want to boost their immune, immune response to these, uh, to these diseases to avoid T cell exhaustion in a certain sense. But like, is there any example that T cell exhaustion can actually protect the uh, organism from infection or cancer? Like if you don't have any T cell exhaustion, then there will be a worse outcome. Um, you, you can get, I mean, it's a fine line. If you would probably could unleash the full potential of your immune cells in, in, in an infection that you might not be able to clear, that will most likely cause severe immunopathology. One example of it is, um, I believe, hepatitis C infections where we have liver's um, damage at the end, and this is driven by your T cells. Um, so it's, it's, it's a fine tuning. Ultimately, at the situation where we are, you just want to boost it and get rid of, of your cancer or your infection. I see. Thanks, Tanu. My question kind of follows on Lisa's um, question about the um, use of uh, LCMV, and in particular, Clone 13. My understanding is that you have to, for that uh, infection to become chronic, you have to um, deplete the CD4 T cell compartment, which of course will induce a degree of dysregulation within your CD8 T cell compartment. Um, so what are your thoughts on, on using Clone 13? Uh, you you get a chronic infection. I, I've done in my life probably thousands of infections. I've never depleted the CD4 T cells. So all of the work that it, it's a it, it's very widely used in the U.S. because it ultimately was established. There's a difference that if you use a standard clone 13 infection, the mice ultimately will clear it at some point, maybe three months later. If you deplete the CD4 T cells at the onset of the infection you get a sustained lifelong viremia, mm. which is different. Um, to your second question, we, we've done some studies where we looked at the early CD4 depletion in LCMV, and within the first few days, there's actually no effect on the CD8 T cells if there are CD4s present or not. This will change at a later time point. Thank you for a great talk. Um, I had a question around immune cold tumors um, and looking at maybe the impact of, say, anti PD1 treatment for those. So, like, what would the impact of maybe tumor mutational burden 
and like the landscape of neoantigens be um, for these T cell responses that we're trying to manipulate and um, how can we utilize these factors to promote a more favorable response? Yes, I think that's a very um, tricky question. Ultimately, I think Paul Beavis is the next seminar speaker. He'll be the main guy. But um, if you don't have a T, if you have a T cell, but it has nothing to target it, it it's very hard to, to get a beneficial clinical outcome. What really PD-1 blockade does, I think on completely it's not known because there are it's not just inhibiting T cells. TVEX express very high level of of PD-1. Um, it's been shown that you prime a dendritic cell differently. So there's a, a lot of and you can even have bystander activation of PD-1 negative T cells. So ultimately I, I clearly cannot answer that question because it, it's it's so difficult. Uh, thank you. Another question from online from Geoffrey. Can the exalted T cell be thought of more as tired than exalted, still functioning, but not highly? So could you please repeat the question? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Can, can the exalted T cell be thought of more as tired than exalted, still functioning, but not highly? Um, ex exhausted T cells, the term is misleading because, yes, they are, compared to fully functional T cells, they are less potent in, in killing infected T cells. But it's clearly been shown, for example, early studies in SIV infected macaques, if you deplete the, CD8, the exhausted CD8 T cells in these, in these monkeys, you get an increase in your viral burden. So they, they very drastically contribute to this to viral control. The control being that you're getting into an equilibrium where I think you don't cause too much damage to the host, but you also don't get too much damage from the from the virus. So I think that's probably where you where you settle in. And yes, if you undergo more severe exhaustion, if you become very useless, more or less, then that will tip that balance over to one or the other side. Thank you. Is there any questions? Can we just? Yep. Yeah. So uh, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Daniel, uh, for this great talk. And yeah, uh, don't forget there's lunch outside.